Welcome everyone. This is uh, the we are gonna call this meeting to order now. It is 6:35 on February 2nd, 2023. And this is a public meeting of the City of Portland Police Accountability Commission Subcommittee on Officer Accountability. If the Spanish language interpreters, Gabi Otalia, can please give the information in the Spanish language interpretation. Hoy, para el día de hoy, vamos a tener um, la interpretación en español disponible. Um, si quieren acceder a esos servicios, por favor, vayan a donde están las tres, um, los tres puntos arriba y van a ver que dice Translation y van a poder escoger la opción de español y en el canal de español en donde vas a poder oír o a mí, o sea, a Gaby, o si no a Talia para hoy el día de interpretación. Y esta cita está sujeta a la ley de Oregon y de la ciudad de Portland. Muchas gracias, Gaby. The city also offers ASL interpretation, which is going to be provided by Andrea and Jill. And Jill, please pin their video feed to see their interpretation throughout the meeting. The closed captioning is turned on in Zoom and as another means of assistance. But please note that this is an automatic captioning services and is not always accurate. The city supports access to meetings of the Police Accountability Commission and can provide other language support as well. Please email in advance of future public meetings either as a response to a public meeting notice or directly to policeaccountability at portlandoregon.gov to ask for other access assistance, including interpretation into other languages. This meeting is a public meeting subject to City of Portland Administrative Code and Oregon State Law and is being recorded. For this meeting, the chat function is enabled for commission members to communicate with each other. Members of the public will be able to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A feature as the commissioners are presenting and or discussing things. If attendees have questions, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A. We hope to use this feature to help guide our conversation during the meeting and future meetings and agenda topics. We'd like to be clear that not all questions will be answered during the meeting, but if answered, both the question and answer will be visible to you and will become part of the meeting record. To access this feature, just click on the Q&A icon in the middle of your screen. And now I will pass it to the co-chairs to offer the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Victoria. Charlie Michelle Wesley, co-chair of the Police Accountability uh, Subcommittee. The PAC currently uses the land acknowledgement on display at City Hall which is, and I will ask my co-chair, Dan Handelman, to read that um, land acknowledgement, please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, co-chair Michelle Wesley. I'm um, uh, just trying to find it here on my documents. Um, I'm Dan Handelman, I use he, him pronouns. I'm uh, the other co-chair of the subcommittee. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again, that this is, as was mentioned, the city's land acknowledgement is not as strong as what I would say if I were writing my own. Um, we acknowledge that the rivers, lakes, streams, and lands of the lower Willamette River rest upon the occupied territories of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Calumet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes. We recognize the many villages, traditions, cultures, and relationships that existed along the river since time immemorial. We recognize these tribes stewarded these lands and rivers since time immemorial for future generations. We recognize and undertake responsibility for the destruction of the river and land, of traditional food sources, sacred places, and multifaceted ways of life. We acknowledge the economic and social values that enabled the harm to the river, including systemic racism, classism, and other systems of oppression that perpetuated harm against Black, Indigenous, and immigrant communities along the river. For this acknowledgement, we commit to honoring and learning from the past and working towards a more equitable and sustainable future for the lower Willamette River. We commit to seeking solutions that acknowledge the inequities of past socioeconomic policies and the harm done to people and our relationships to these lands and waters. 
Thank you, Co-Chair Dan. Now we're gonna pass to our communities agreements and as every meeting, we're gonna review it and read it. If we can have it, please. Thank you. Let's start reading it. There is three pages and we can at the end. I can ask the question. Please uh, change the page. Now, I ask the question, do we all commit to following the community agreements for today's meeting and to gently call in in our college and collaborators if needed? And if you agree to that, you can show me your thumbs or hands. Thank you. I will pass it over to the co-chairs to discuss the timeline. Hello, thank you again. Mm. This meeting is part of the Police Accountability Commission's powers and duties phase of work, which focuses on the functions of the new system. Future phases of work will develop the form of the new system, as well as how it relates to the rest of the city government and the transition plan from our current system to the new one. The commission will present all proposed changes to the city council later in 2023 for their consideration and approval. This slide shows the outcome documents for the powers and duties phase based on the agenda and scope approved by the commission. This subcommittee focuses on the processes the new oversight board and agency will use to address administrative officer misconduct, complaints, investigations, findings, discipline, and more. This slide is the current project plan for the powers and duties phase of the Police Accountability Commission's work. It will be updated as needed throughout the phase of work. This slide is for members of the public to be able to understand how the commission gets from now through the end of the phase, which focuses on identifying areas of agreement among commission members as to the functions of the new system. Today's meeting is part of the green box with the red border near the bottom of the screen. Following today, here are the upcoming meetings of the Police Accountability Commission. Tonight is anticipated to be the final meeting of the subcommittee and no further meetings are currently scheduled for it. Moving forward, we'd like to highlight the full commission meets next Monday, February 6th, and next Thursday, February 9th, and may conclude the powers and duties phase of work during these two meetings. The commission is planning a community listening session and Q&A for Thursday, February 16th. The commission does not meet February 20th as the city observes President's Day. After the powers and duties phase of work comes the structure and details phase of work. And the first subcommittee meeting for that phase will be February 27th. Today's meeting agenda includes working through the update 
updated co-chair's draft of the agree areas of agreement and officer accountability flagging items for further discussion, resolving items, and possibly referring the document to the full Police Accountability Commission for their consideration next week. The subcommittee will also hear public comment during today's meeting. Oh, and then, yeah, there's two. Do you read that, uh, Victoria, or do I? I, do we just, have it's, it's up to you. We're going to start the discussing the the uh, PAC areas of agreement now. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Co Chair Charlie. We're now going to start discussing the draft PAC areas of agreement on officer accountability, which the subcommittee is tasked with referring to the full commission for its approval. I will pass it to Co Chair Charlie and Dan to explain. Any updates to the document we're going to review? Uh, thank you, Facilitator Lara. And um, as I said before, I'm Dan Handelman, and I, I'm going to give a little recap, not only for the uh, people in the audience who are watching tonight, which uh, there are seven people in the audience, but um, also for the fellow members of the subcommittee, because um, uh, Co-Chair Michelle Wesley and I were able to do the two interviews we talked about last week, um, which was talked to Yume Delegato, uh, who's a member of the Citizen Review Committee, has attended many police review board meetings, and to um, uh, Jared Hager, who's an attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice that has, has the settlement agreement with the city. And I just want to give a couple of highlights. We had meant to send the notes to you before the meeting, but uh, there were some computer problems, and it just, you know, there, was, there wasn't a lot of time between the last meeting and now but we'll get those notes to you as soon as we can. Uh, and there may be parts where we're going through the draft where some of the comments that we got um, are relevant to. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about that after after I give the full um, spiel to everybody about how what, what we're doing. So our subcommittee is tasked with basically finding out what happens from the time an incident occurs all the way through the time an officer may or may not get disciplined for the in, uh, incident uh, in question. So we have been looking at a flow chart that has been until now on six separate slides. And today I copied and pasted those six pieces into one giant piece of paper, which is 22 inches wide, by 24 inches wide by 22 inches tall. And if you could share a screen um, staff, that would be great. I just wanna walk us quickly through this again um, to again, ground us in what it is that we're talking about when we're getting to these little kind of nitty gritty sub paragraphs. So, um, uh, over there on the left side, you see that uh, the incident happens, and then a community member will file a complaint. Hmm. Although it could also go to a preliminary investigation, so there's there's things that need to be fixed on the flow chart. Uh, and it, a, a investigation can happen automatically without the complainant if it's a deadly force or other incident that's kind of outlined by our city code and by the charter. So, uh, but anyway, the, the complainant will be signed an advocate, um, and then. Uh, there's a, an intake investigation or a preliminary investigation uh, where um, different branches might happen, the complaint might be dismissed, there might be an informal resolution, or there might be mediation. Um, I'm going to ask you to slide over to the right just in, uh, to look quickly at what happens when if a police officer files a complaint against another officer um, uh, where they uh, can, in our design, this is you know not approved by anybody yet, uh, and that's true of this whole flow chart, that they can select to go through whatever uh, investigating body there is in the city. It's called Internal Affairs right now at the Police Bureau, but um, it may change. Or they can select to go to the board if they want to, if they feel like that's a more neutral investigating body. So that brings us, the arrow brings us back to the um, preliminary investigation. So let's move on to that purple box, uh, the um, full investigation. Um, and scroll on down to see what the full investigation looks like. Uh, so then that uh, is uh, the administrative investigation, meaning it's not criminal, um, about whether the officer violated policy. There might be a separate criminal investigation if there's possible crimes committed by the officer. Um, the administrative investigation could end up being dismissed. The complainant can appeal that. Um, and But it, it, otherwise, the finished investigation goes to a hearing. And that's the, um, that I don't know what the correct color is, that kind of crimson purple box. And then that... Uh, uh, the hearing ho panel holds a preliminary hearing. Uh, 
which results later in a full hearing, and I'll talk about that more later tonight. Oh, which reminds me of something else I want to share with you. Um, and if the uh, there are findings that the complainant disagrees that they can appeal, and there's findings and discipline the officer disagrees that they can appeal. So if we go over to the right side of the screen, you'll see the appeals um, flow chart and scroll down a little. Um, and then there are three possible outcomes of that, that either they agree with the original finding, they send it back for more investigation, or they make a new finding. And if they make a new finding where there's a um, out of policy uh, decision about the officer, then we go back over here to the discipline process, which is over on the left, where either the officer accepts the discipline, and again, we're gonna get into a deep discussion about that tonight, or the officer doesn't accept the discipline, and then they have four options <laughs> how to appeal. So I was thinking about how our, our goal here and the goal of the ballot measure was to kind of even the playing field. Like right now, this system that we have favors police officers, heavily favors police officers. So we're trying to balance the scales. But the three other ways they can appeal are not things that are open to community members. But then again, the community members aren't the ones facing the, uh, the charges, so to speak. Um, so in addition to filing an appeal like we looked at already, they can go to a due process hearing um, which is, you know, uh, allowed by the Constitution. Uh, they can be referred to the Civil Service Board, which is allowed by the city charter, or they can go uh, file a grievance through their um, collective bargaining unit, uh, which m might lead to arbitration. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's the flow chart in a nutshell. Uh, so the other document I want to share with you before I uh, summarize those two interviews briefly, but and then we get to the document, uh, is a word... Uh, processing document, it's not very pretty. I just typed it up between four o'clock and now. But um, this is the timeline as I understand it uh, of, oh, hmm, that's not the right document, I don't think. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> we'll get to that one in a second, just. <laughs> okay, um, the, the timeline as I understand it of how the system works now. Um, now remember that the DOJ agreement says the city has to do investigations within 180 days. And our system says we have to do um, uh, investigation within 180 days. And this breaks down, I'm gonna, if we have time at the end of the meeting, I wanna go into detail on this, but this breaks down how those 180 days work right now, the best as I can guess, because I couldn't find the document that I've seen before, outline is. But the good news is, briefly, I think that our system will either match this timeline or actually speed it up by as much as three weeks. So, um, Woohoo, bully for us. Um, and I, I, again, I, I won't get into the details of that later. Um, okay, and finally, uh, now there's not a document attached to this yet, um, the uh, interviews that we did, uh, Co Chair Michelle Wesley and I did. So uh, we talked, when, when we talked with Mr. Delegato, who's in the audience today, I really want to thank um, uh, Mr. Delegato for spending the time with us. Uh, he said that the case files for use of force incidents, uh, you know, general use of force incidents that aren't deadly force, can be uh, two, can, can you stop sharing the screen so I can see the, my other commissioners? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So they can be 200 to 600 pages long. So this is for an ordinary run of the mill use of force case. And it takes five to six hours to review these. Uh, for deadly force incidents, the files can be 600 to 2000 pages and it takes 10 to 20 hours to review those. And I think that's something you know to keep in mind for the next phase, but. Just basically, as we're as we're designing the system, um, I think it's something really uh, again. It kind of reinforces the, the um, structure that we've, we're proposing right now. Um, for the hearings themselves, uh, Mr. Delgado said, and this is at the police review board. Um, if I didn't say that already, for non deadly force cases, it can be two to three hours long, and sometimes the deadly forces cases take less than two hours um, because the way the system works now, they kind of rush through. Um, any discussion that tries to come up about systemic problems. Now we've built those systemic discussions into our proposed system, but I think it's um, of concern. But Mr. Delegato also said, and I forgot about this, um, that those uh, investigations, let's call them, of deadly force shootings right now include a review not only of the officer who used the deadly force, the, but also the officers who may have used less than lethal force um, and of the supervisors who come on the scene and you know, do things like call in the ambulances and separate witnesses and things like that. Um, we didn't include that in our um, the previous discussion, so I want to add that in tonight. 
uh, with your approval, of course. Um, so, uh, but, and the last thing I want to leave you with is uh, just a quote that he said, which is, um, when you review the deadly force cases, those cases you will live uh, will live with you for the rest of your life. That's a direct quote. Um, and he said, you'll relive it. You'll wonder whether you should have said something or voted somehow differently. So this is, again, something we have to think about for the people who are going to be joining this board and hearing these cases in the future. All right, so uh, Mr. Uh, Hager, oh, uh, one last note. He said that all the police review board hearings have been held since COVID uh, virtually, which is uh, the Access to Information Subcommittee raised that. We've raised it somewhere in our um, flow chart as well, um, but it apparently is not a huge deal to do things virtually. All right. Um, so, Mr. Hager's, uh, the most main thing that I want to get you across to you from the discussion we had, and we were asking about stipulated discipline and findings, and we're going to revisit that paragraph anyway tonight. Um, but uh, uh, one of those key questions I think some of our fellow commissioners had in the uh, research phase was if the officers offered a certain kind of discipline and they say, yeah, I'll take that discipline, I'll, uh, and um, you know, I agree. I admit that I did what you said I did. Um, that is the finding that's going to happen. It's not. There's no plea deal. Like so, if they during the course of the investigation accepted responsibility and said, "Yeah, I did what you said," um, and I'll, you know, I'm probably willing to take whatever you want. That could be a factor in coming to what the discipline is. But once the board says we're proposing this discipline, when they stipulate to say, "Yes, I agree to that discipline," it's not changed that time. I think that's a really important point. I just want to make sure that people understand that. Uh, and the other, well, actually, the most important part about stipulated discipline, we're going to have to read it tonight, is that it is designed both in the DOJ agreement and in the city code as happening after a full investigation happens. So it is not something, and so there's some um, language we have to strike from our draft. Uh, it is not something that happens instead of an investigation. It happens at the end of an investigation. Does that make sense? I see uh, only a couple of your faces, but... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to stipulated discipline when we come up to that part of the thing. So if anybody has questions about any of this, this preliminary stuff I just said, let me know. Otherwise, um, we can jump into, uh, I think we're at A9 at the end of our last, the end of our last discussion. Thank you, Coach Dan. We will now move into discussing the draft areas of agreements on officer accountability. This will include reviewing the document, which has had some updates to the text based on previous comments. It will also include revisiting items flagged for further discussion in advance of the decision to refer. We ask you to follow our normal discussion rules. Please be brief each time you speak, even though you can speak multiple times. Please be facilitated and remember that we use a waiter stack in our discussions. Finally, please be forward looking in your comments. Okay, let's uh, start the discussion now. So we're gonna have staff um, direct us to the A9 and uh, Co-Chair Michelle Wesley will read the first uh, piece. Oh, wait, big important thing too. What we're about to look at is the new format for the document, which has been in uh, kind of uh, very, very rough form until now. So sections A and I think all of B are um, now uh, translated into this new format. Um, it was only posted a little bit before the meeting, but we really want to thank staff for doing this. It looks so much better um, and it's going to be easier to follow when we bring it to the full commission. All right, so back to you, Co-Chair Michelle Wesley. Okay, yeah, that looks beautiful. Thank you, Co-Chair Handelman. Waiting till we get to A9. Oh, and just as a side note, because of Microsoft Word's little gremlins, um, the numbering is slightly different from the numbering that we have used up to this point. So anybody who's comparing notes between meetings, um, the sub, sub, sub paragraphs might have slightly different numbers. Okay, so uh, my understanding is uh, we are just going to read the ones for further discussion, correct? Yes, yes correct. Go share, Charlie. Okay, so uh, we'll be at, uh, oh boy, yeah, the numbering has changed. So under B, I can't see, A9 dismissals, 
B under B item uh, Roman numeral four, I huh. think. Yes. <laughs> Is that how we're describing those now? Okay. Uh, applying an objective standard the complaint is trivial, frivolous, or not made in good faith. So what we were looking at on that one is that wording um, to find something less um, kind of judgmental. Um, so that's open for discussion. Yes, thank you, Co-Chair. Charlie, as there, we reviewed this, are there any discussion or questions? or suggestions and how we can move or change this item. Yes, uh, Commissioner, um, uh, Co-Chair Charlie, you wanna comment? Mm -hmm. on, no, oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Catherine. Yeah, well, I'm just, um, I'm not sure this is the solution, but um, um, we, one of the, just thinking about the standards that would apply, like in a court, you could just say the complaint fails to state a claim. I, I don't know that I, I what I, what I was um, wondering about is the difference between three and four where we're, um, and whether we need four if we have three, that's that's the um, question. Mm -hmm. I so I was trying to understand the distinction between the two and this is saying no act of misconduct would have occurred. And I'm, I'm wondering if what we're trying to get at is like the, the complaint itself doesn't really state um, any basis for an investigation or doesn't, um, doesn't, rise to the level of um you know of describing a situation that the um that the board could investigate so that's that's what i was um trying to come up with thank you thank you and i will pass it to co-chair charlie and then co-chair dan thank you yeah i was um wondering yeah if we could combine those and just add what's in the something similar to what's in the um uh, over on the side, I forget what you call those, but um, so so minor, it would not justify the, uh, an investigation or something like that. And is that true? Are things so minor, right? They don't justify. Thank you, Co-Chair Charlie. Co-Chair Dan? Yeah, well, that, I was he heading towards something like that. I think that was, you know, building off what Commissioner McDowell was saying, you know, not rising to the level of, and I think uh, this is one place, and I, I know we were, we're sort of having this ongoing background discussion about how much stuff we're going to leave to the board to figure out and how much stuff we want to build in to make sure that we put sufficient guardrails up that our vision gets enacted by city council. I think that's something that we can leave that language in and have uh, the new board fill that out, right? So, or would be so minor it would not justify the time spent investigating. And uh, we can we don't have to say um, what we think minor is right now. Or we can do it you know, if we have time towards the end of our process. We can go back to it. But uh, I think that is very good language um, for us to work with. Thank you, Co-Chair Charlie. Do you have your hand? Do you want to say something else? No. Thank you. Okay, then is there any further discussion? No? Commissioner Catherine, do you have any suggestions? No? Okay, I will ask them. Uh, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was or what is now and taking off mm, counseling number four? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was as it is now? Thank you. Let's move on. Can we move on to the next one? Please, okay. thank you. Remember to let the uh, facilitator know if you agree with that. Thank you. Great, yeah, and I, I just wanna say that I'm glad this is in the new format because now it'll renumber itself. All right, let's go on down to the next one. 
So the next one is uh, a question under B2, which is the basic elements of misconduct investigation. And it's down under this part F2 below that. B2 F Roman numeral two says, however, a committee member concerned about the confidentiality of certain information may request that parts of their transcript be redacted for confidentiality purposes, so long as the redaction does not interfere with the ability to fully investigate. This sounds kind of uh, related to the thing we talked about at the last meeting, where uh, you know, a community member who admits to something that um, could get them in trouble with the law, that, that there is a reason that that could be redacted from the record. Um, I think we had that discussion at the last meeting and came to a good conclusion on that. But this is more, you know, if they, in addition to that, um, if they're describing another person or, you know, again, I guess activity of their own, but another person or, or organization that they're part of, that it's not really relevant to the investigation. Um, and it could uh, just distract from the, you know, what happened at the scene of what happened. Um, they might want to ask for something to be reacted. So, uh, the, qu the question I guess we had also, can this be done in a way that's fair to the police and balance the needs of the complainants with the needs of the investigation is also something we're supposed to be thinking about. Thank you, Kasher Dan. Is there a, any suggestion or questions or comments? Yeah, Commissioner Kateri? Um, would it be sufficient to just say, so long as the redaction does not interfere with the ability to fully investigate or the due process rights of the officer. And maybe too broad, but again, that I'm just thinking about what um, Commissioner Dan just said about leaving some of this for the commission, the new board to decide, um, you know, to define what that is. But I, I think that's the consideration we're trying to get at. Okay, thank you, uh, Co-Chair Dan. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think, I think I'm think i okay with leaving that in. Uh, what, one of the concerns that was raised during the last the negotiation process for the police association is that they're allowed to get the names of the people who filed complaints against them. And um, I think that makes a lot of community members nervous uh, if they want to file anonymously. Um, so I, 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 I suppose that since that right now is part of the due process, their due process rights, that's what it would be. But if that gets changed, then that'll get changed also. So I guess I, I, I'm feeling like I'm comfortable with it, although currently that um, leaves some uh, some um, unease that I just want to express on the record. So I, I, I could vote for this, but I just wanted to say that. Okay, thank you, Coach Dan. Is there, as, let me ask the question then, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to what it is now? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was as what it is now? Thank you. Okay, let's, can we move on? I just, I didn't see if Commissioner Husseini raised his hand on the Zoom or not, but. Okay. Sima, Commissioner Sima, I'm sorry, you were to have a question? No, he said no, he doesn't have any question. But are you agreed to move on? Oh, no? okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, let's let's go move on. Apologies. Next up is B4. Um, and just as we're scrolling by it, there was, you'll, you may see a couple other comments that are not flags for further discussion. They're just notes that it may be helpful to get more information by the time the full commission approves it. So if you're seeing a comment here, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a flag for further discussion. So B3 has one of those, but it's not flagged for further discussion. The next one is B4, which is stipulated discipline. And <clears throat> Uh, I think this relates to something that Coach Chair Dan and Tra Coach Chair Charlie were talking about, so I'll pass it back to them. Yeah, come, uh, Coach Chair Michelle Wesley, would you like me to deal with this? Yes, I would. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll begin by saying that, as I said, I you know again reading the city code, uh, 
and reading the DOJ agreement and talking to Mr. Hager. Um, it is very apparent that stipulated discipline comes at the end of the uh, findings process and not here in the investigation. So my, first of all, and we don't have to do this right now, staff, but I, just, I would like to have this renumbered to be number C5, which will be at the end of the uh, findings process. Um, so um, uh, if you can just put that as a note, instead of before putting it as C5, um, as a proposed change right there. Um, and then, uh, oh, I wrote this up on in notes that I could um, say it into the record. Uh, so um, uh, the thing that says, in which an officer admits to misconduct uh, and accepts discipline, that should stay. And the words, without a full investigation, should be struck. Um, then in C5A, um, the second sentence should be cut. So it should just say, to expedite the process, officers can admit to misconduct and accept the proposed discipline. Um, and then the guidelines about what can and can't be used for stipulated discipline is in the next section. So the um, guidelines, uh, the guardrails are, are in section B. Um, so then, um, Here's what I'd like to propose. Oh, so then we have you know the list of the uh, items that can't uh, aren't eligible for stipulated discipline and which are which are um, eligible. So the, the, I'm not proposing any changes to that. But I think and um, uh, what is now C5A, um, or actually after what's C5A. Uh, hmm. uh, uh, I would add, yeah like to add a new C5B that says. Um, the officer, I should paste in the chat too. The officer may have up to seven days to inform the board that he stipulated to the findings and discipline, thus waiving all four possible avenues of appeal. Um, so this is this is how this expedites the process. Um, and again, this is you know sort of, sort of we bounce this off of Mr. Hager just to make sure that what we're understanding is correct, so that. Um, the uh, advantage of this for the community member, for the officer, for the board, is that the officer is saying, yeah, okay, I did it, and I'll, um, I admit to this misconduct, and I'm taking the, the, the discipline that you've proposed. Uh, we put in a seven-day uh, grace period after the end of the hearing, so they don't have to make the decision on the spot because this is you know, an employment issue for them. Um, but uh, that's far less than the appeals window that we gave of 30 days. So, um, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, they have four avenues of appeal, which the uh, community member doesn't have. And uh, I don't know if we need to put it in writing here, but as I um, mentioned in my opening statement today, the, um, you know, the fact that they stipulated discipline does not change the level of discipline being proposed. Uh, maybe we should add that to the end of A. <laughs> um, uh, so the second yeah. sentence, yeah, would then be uh, right. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair Dan. Uh, Commissioner Devi? I'm just curious, why would an officer want to engage in this uh, option? Uh, well, just uh, because they, let's say there's video of them doing it. I mean, there's no point in arguing about it if there's no dispute of the facts, right? So they and and, and so Mr. Hager also in, in indicated that if along the way, if the officer um, admits that they did it, uh, it can help speed up the investigation also because it, it so it might, could be actually be helpful for the complainant. Um, and uh, uh, and you know, it just means that they don't have this hanging over their head, um, this uh, investigation hanging over their head. They just say, okay, I'm done. You know. I know other people think I should fight this, but you know, look at the facts. You know, <laughs> there's no point in this. Let's just get it done with. So, is that helpful, Commissioner Iona? Yeah, I just was trying to figure out what was in it for them, and so that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Devi. I will pass it to Commissioner Sima. Uh, yeah, was there any feedback from um, uh, Attorney Hager uh, on or Councilor Hager, uh, uh, Superlative Hager on? Uh, uh, any examples of how an officer has actually utilized this or any precedent? 
Uh, no, uh, but I think I mentioned this at the last meeting. This provision only kicked in about three years ago, either three or four years ago. Um, it was added to the DOJ settlement agreement when the PCCP was created. And uh, I testified as a member of Portland Cop Watch to the city council and said, look, when these things happen, you need to report to the public that it happened. You know, so, they're, the, so the current system, um, this bypasses them having to have a police review board hearing. Uh, so that's, that's the advantage in the current system. But in our system, the finding is made by our board at a hearing. Um, but uh, so there have only been, uh, you know, so anyway, so I told city council they had to report on it. And so they put it into the code that any stipulated findings have to go into the police review board um, report that come out twice a year. And there, I believe there have been either three or four cases that have happened since then in four years. So it's very rarely happens, and there's a very limited scope of what it can do. As you, you know, if you remember the guardrails that we built in, and they're already written in the city code, it can't be for force, can't be for deadly force, um, and we're proposing it shouldn't be for a case where uh, it was they didn't file a report about force, but um, because the avoiding filing a report is a form of covering up. So there's, you know, the lot. It's, it's limited to the very, very minor cases with very minor discipline. If that helps you at all, Commissioner Husseini. Thank you. And I will pass it to staff. Yeah, it may also be helpful to remember that the PAC recognized in its barriers and best practices document, um, they, they cited a statement from um, uh, someone, I believe it was the president of the police union, but I, I'm not 100% certain, uh, saying that the length of the process and and having to wait is uh is a burden on officers accused of misconduct as well they they cited that as a a barrier they saw in the current system um where this would i believe and, and co-chairs can correct me if i'm wrong that the, later in the document the discipline is imposed after the end of the filing of an appeal period and so this would allow that to be shrunk down um to allow for that discipline to just be imposed faster, um, which which may help address the barrier that they recognized the the police union. Thank you, staff. Okay, yeah, go share that. All right. So just to recap, um, when we're when we're deciding on this, one of the things we're doing is we're asking to move it over to C five, which is in part two, which is uh, the document still in the old format, and we're going to look at it when we're done with B. Um, and uh oh i forget what i was going to say now all right well if i remember before we get done um i'll, I'll let you know thank you since we're moving this to c5 oh staff do you want to say something i just had a question um for co-chairs charlie and dan in the current system does stipulating to discipline involve an admission of misconduct by the officer because that is in yes. and okay. Stipulated findings and discipline, which means that they they agree to the finding and they agree to this one. So yes, they say yes, I did that, and I'll take the the thing. I remembered what I was going to say, which is that while this will speed up the process for the findings where the officer was found out of policy, if there are findings in the same case where the officer was not found out of policy, the um, complainant still has the option, even though the officers uh, stipulated to the discipline on the sustained finding, or the uh, out of policy finding in our case, that the uh, complainant could still file an appeal. It doesn't stop their ability to appeal. And I don't know if we should put that in explicitly into the text somewhere. Uh, what's, uh, what's, is E the last thing, staff? So maybe we should put an F, uh, you know, stipulating to uh, um, out of policy findings. Stipulating to out of policy findings does not, uh, uh, whatever, uh, re remove the uh, complainant's ability to appeal the non uh, the, the non out of policy findings. It's funny because we would normally say non sustained, but we're trying to get away from that term. Well, it's not just an in-policy finding. It could also be an unfounded or a um, 
uh, insufficient evidence finding. So that's why I'm saying any other. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay, I will ask, I know we're moving this to C5, but I will ask um, this part first, moving an A and B, the whole part that we're seeing right now. And my, my question is, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was at least to now with the proposed changes? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was uh, to the proposed changes? Thank you. Let's move on. Can we move on to the next change? Yes, is F. And I will ask, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Thank you. Can we move on? So staff, is the next one the B5 that I flagged earlier today? Yes. I should probably take this one too. <laughs> You're getting some time off there, Coach here, Michelle Wesley. Um, all right, so B5. Uh, is about the uh, investigations of deadly force. And as I said, as we were talking with um, Mr. Delgado about how the police review board currently works, you know, I read all these reports and I've never, you know, I'm not allowed to go to these hearings, so I don't really know what they go like, but, but I can tell you from reading the reports that one of the things they do, in addition to reviewing the officer that shot at the person or, you know, sat on their chest and made them not be able to breathe or whatever it was, uh, they also review other officers who are on the scene who may have used force, and they also do a review to see whether the officers who supervisors who came on the scene appropriately, you know, put up the crime scene tape and separated the witnesses and called for medical assistance, all these other um, really important things that police have to do after there's a deadly force, uh, the use of deadly force. And, you know, right now that's not really contemplated in the way we've written this, uh, this um, section. So, um, uh, let me see. Uh, so I think we should add an A4 uh, and an A an A4, yeah, and an A A Roman numeral four, and it's going to have two subsections. Uh, just uh, so you know, um, stop. So the investigation shall include. Um, that's the first part. And then uh, the first sub under that is. Uh, a review of the supervisors and others who were on the scene, including investigations of officers who used force or may have precipitated the deadly force or the use of deadly force. Uh, okay, and then the second sub, um, as numbered by Mr. Microsoft, is the final investigation will also be sent to the training division uh, for an analysis to be presented to the board at the hearing on the deadly force incident. That kind of replicates, you know, I, I said this way back when we first met each other, that one of the worst things that happened between when the old PIIAC uh, system got turned into the current IPR system is that the things that were working got thrown out. And these things are not stuff that the community really had a say in, but I think they're really important, and I think they're things that we should probably keep in the process. So that's why I'm proposing to put them in here. Thank you. Oh, okay, Victoria, you are muted. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, proposed, I mean, discussion about these proposed changes or questions? Okay, then let me ask the question. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to what it is now? And let me see. Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to what it is now? 
Thank you. Is staff? Yeah, just a request for the co-chairs, if you can send uh, the specific place that the document that was cited there for the footnoting, that may be helpful on that section. Okay, thank you. Very well. Thank you. Can we move on to the next one? Yes, okay, thank you. Apologies was muted. That is everything that is under um, categories A uh, and B, which are intake and investigations respectively. And they're the only ones that are in this version. It was part one before. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna switch over to the other um, document, which um, you're all familiar with, which was part two um, before and begins with category C. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. And just as a, I guess, as a header to this entire thing, the formatting of part two will eventually look like the document you are, you are now seeing by the time it's presented to the full commission. And it will be all in one part, right? Right. Okay, we continue with the discussion. So there are, the next one is under C1. <clears throat> Um, as you can see, there are a lot of comments that just need to be cleared. They're not um, still active, but the part that is still active is the last section here, C1, D1, and it's the flag was uh, uh, whether or not the this sort of, um, this should be a recommendation that eventually ends up in city code or whether or not it should be something that is recommended to the various uh, other bodies or supervisors that investigate officer complaints not involving community members. And this was a, a discussion that exceeded five minutes and was flagged for further discussion and circled back to. Thank you, Steph. So, oh, Co-Chair Michelle Wesley, would you read the existing language into the record, please? Certainly. That's C1D1, correct? Yeah, there we go. Uh, when the body or supervisor investigating um, or supervisor investigating officer that sounds weird, or did I just read it weird? Anyway, officer complaints not involving community members um, conducts an investigation. Um, these findings shall also um, be used for consistency. Okay, is there any questions, discussions about this? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Catherine? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't, I can't remember what that means at all. It just, um, maybe somebody can explain this to me. Um, so, I, see, I flagged it for discussion, so I must have understood it at some point, but I don't understand it now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Commissioner McDowell, uh, the, the findings, uh, the four basic findings are uh, out of policy, in policy, unfounded, and insufficient evidence. And then the additional findings, the systemic findings are policy failure, training failure, supervisory failure, communication failure, and equipment failure. And then the, the line above that says, all these findings shall be applied whether the case is generated by a complaint or if the board investigates as required by the city code and charter. So then trying not to um, name internal affairs, we said when the body or supervisor, so body could be internal affairs, so when the body or supervisor investigating officer complaints not involving community members conducts an investigation, I think we need to repunctuate that maybe, uh, these findings shall also be used for consistency. I don't think there should be a comma after community members in that sentence. To help Commissioner McDowell and everybody. Okay, is there? So any I'm going to make. You know, I'm now going to make my argument for leaving this in. Um, my argument for leaving this in is that you know you get these reports from uh, no IPR or sometimes from the bureau about what kind of cases they've had, what the outcomes are, and it says, okay, for this deadly force case, we had uh, you know three officers found. Uh, 
in policy and one found in policy with a debriefing. Uh, and for this case where the supervisor talked to the uh, investigated the officer for misconduct, uh, we had two substantiated and one unsubstantiated allegation. And then you get to the one where the community said, uh, filed a complaint and it says, okay, we have three sustained and two uh, insufficient or non-sustained findings. Um, and it's just like, why are they different? Why do we have all these different findings? You know, it's all the same question. Was there a misconduct or not? Uh, and if, uh, or maybe maybe there was, maybe there wasn't in the case of insufficient evidence. So it, I just think that it's, it's helpful for us. I mean, again, city council gets to, you know, reconfigure what we're proposing to them, but I think we should put forward as a proposal from the commission that the finding should be universal regardless of what kind of investigation it is. Thank you, Coach Dan. And the staff try to clean the statement for clarity to make it clear. And if some, you want to read it or anybody, Coach Charlie or you, or just everyone can read it from here. Yeah, would someone else read it? Because I keep reading it over and over and I, I'm not, um, it's just not flowing, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense. Okay, well, with st staff, I'm going to change one word as we go along. What, what, he, what the staff has written is it says, these findings shall also be used for consistency, um, no comma, these are, uh, findings shall also be used for consistency by any other body or supervisor who investigates officer complaints which do not involve community members. Um, that clear now? I think that's good. A good rewrite. I don't see a lot of nodding heads. Oh, I see one nodding head. I'll, I'll read it again. These findings shall also be used for consistency by any other body or supervisor who investigates officer complaints which do not involve community members. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, staff, and thank you, co chair Dan. Is there any additional suggestions or questions about this statement? Okay. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the new suggested changes? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the new suggested changes? Okay, thank you very much. Can we move on to the next item <clears throat> for discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we can move on. Oh, yes, Commissioner Debbie. There's an interesting question in the Q&A about the difference between deadly force and other cases. Uh, I, I don't want to be distracting. I just read that and it applied to what we just talked about. So, right. and, and I responded to that saying, no, we, as we just discussed, all the findings will apply to everything equally. Now, clearly, sure. if an officer is being investigated for deadly force, everybody knows the deadly force happens. So there's not going to be an insufficient evidence finding on that. But, um, but that's okay. I mean, it's, it's there if they need it for something. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Debbie, and thank you, Co Chair Dan. Okay, let's move to the next one. There are two different flags under C2. One of them is um, under C2A1, panels shall be no smaller than five board members. And there were essentially uh, back and forth and more forth between three different ways to uh, address this, whether it was that the size of the panel should be um, something left for a future, a future conversation, whether it should be included as a minimum number in this document, um, because it, uh, it was proposed to ensure the, the, men, the mentions here in the comments of uh, diversity of life experience, et cetera, um, or whether or not that should be the thing that is written and the number not be the um, necessarily put in or put in as like a footnote. So that, that was a conversation that exceeded five minutes and then was flag to come back to. The other one is later on in the document, in this section, I should say, and it's on an unrelated topic. Thank you, staff. And uh, could you, Charlie or Dan, do you want to read it? Is it my turn now? Did you it's your turn. It, it is your turn, Dan. 
Mm -hmm. right, so what I'm going to hear, I'm going to, to for context, I'm going to read C2A and C2A1. So C2A says the board may create panels to hear cases to determine findings about whether policies were violated. So we've agreed to that. C2A1 panel shall be no smaller than five board members. Um, let me read through the rest of it too, because it, it all ties together. So C2A2, in more serious cases, these panels should have more members than in other cases. Um, C2A3 says the panel should be created to ensure diversity based on life experience, race, gender, and other factors. And we raised a question there that we'll have to come back to uh, about whether if the members are appointed by different people or entities. Um, and uh, appointed to be nominated, I guess. Um, okay. And then I, I, don't, I don't think the last one is relevant to this discussion. So, okay. Discuss. Any discussion, questions, or suggestions? for these comments, Commissioner Catherine? Yeah, I, I guess I um, was the one who suggested that we um, have the minimum be three. And I did that um, because of my concerns about um, the board getting swamped by um, cases and not being able to meet the um, 180 day um, time frames um, for all of the cases if we had um, five member panels for all cases. So um, I, I guess my thought was that would just allow more flexibility so that you would, we're already saying in more serious cases, you should have a larger panel. So in the more serious cases, you would have five or seven or whatever, but in more minor cases, um, just as a way of expediting the process and making sure the 180 day time frame was met. Um, it seemed to me uh, uh, that it might be important to set the minimum at a smaller number, recognizing there's a trade off that you won't have as much diversity. Um, as you would on a larger panel. But I, I, I think in my mind, I was um, remembering the things that we've heard from um, IPR about the challenges of meeting the 180 day um, timeframe under the current system. And the reason that they're not, you know, they don't take all the cases is because they easily get swamped. So, so that was, that was, those were the considerations that um, I had in mind when I suggested a smaller minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Catherine. Are there any additional comments of what Commissioner Catherine proposed? Yes, Estaf? And just to clarify, I think the original conversation was whether or not this makes sense to put into this section or into this document at all. Okay. Um, and that may be resolved implicitly by changing the number, I assume that that may be a, a, a tacit consensus that there is a desire to have it in here, but I just wanted to flag that that was the original question. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Debbie? Well, I still lean towards the five number just because I, you know, maybe we just need to have a really big board if, uh, if, if we can't, uh, you know, and panel a group of five for these cases. So, um, and again, I mean, I'm not like wedded to that. It's just, I wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Uh, Co-Chair Dan? Oh, uh, yeah, Co -chair Dan well, I, I like Chair Michelle Wesley go first. Yes, thank you. Co-Chair Charlie? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think, just because it's a, a lesser, I guess, important case that it, it should still deserve diversity. But the second thing is, is like, can this be changed later on? If, if I mean, this is not set in stone. I mean, the board can make a decision to have a bigger or smaller um, panel. Right. Well, so, um, um, Co -chair, um let me just come, uh, Co-Chair Dan, let me just pass it to Commissioner Christian. He has, oh, his... I didn't see their hand. Okay. Thank you. No, sorry. I, I put my hand down, uh, after I put it on. That was why you didn't see it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Co-Chair Dan, go ahead. Okay. So again, as background on this, 
The Cities Review Committee, um, the current appeals panel uh, for the city, had, um, well, it was originally designed to only have seven people and um, community members pushed back and they expanded to nine. And then when the, the DOJ came to town, they expanded that number again to 11 um, to help make sure there was more diversity. And then they, in order to make it easier to, for them to meet and have a quorum, so they could have uh, hold these appeal hearings, they said that the quorum of this 11 member body is five people. Um, now, um, when we get to the, our next uh, phase, we can talk more about um, whether that should only apply for appeals versus when they're having votes to accept policy changes on behalf of the entire board. But that's how things were designed currently, was to take you know a, a board that only has 11 members on it that was hearing or that, at that time around eight, eight appeals a year. And so now we're talking about you know possibly hundreds of cases a year. Um, but make it so that the quorum is five. And uh, I think, I, you know, again, saying what my co-chair just raised, um, is not only diversity uh, in um, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, and um, you know, other, uh, other such factors, but the life experience is really important. So you could walk in and see somebody uh, who looks like you on the panel and feel comfortable, and then they open their mouth and say something that's like, I don't agree with that at all. Um, so I think the broader the panel, the more uh, different life experiences you'll have. So that you, it's less likely that you'll have, um, uh, for lack of a better term, tokenism going on. That's my um, argument in favor of, of putting the number five actually into the document that we send to city council. And uh, to answer your question, Co-Chair Michelle Wesley, uh, it would take a vote of city council if this goes into the code to change it, which is a little harder than the board made the decision. But it should probably be one of those things where they test it out for a while and then if when they, the continuous improvement we talked about <laughs> um, in another subcommittee, um, they could say, well, this isn't really working. Um, but I think we, as our subcommittee, passing it on to the full commission, I would, I, I'm strongly, uh, again, so re re recommending that we put the number five in there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Co-Chair Charlie? Uh, my question is going to be C2A2, so. Okay. I think we can... Since we're not making changes on this, I don't know when we, we can move on or I need to ask the question. I'm confused. You should ask. I should ask. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is uh, can I, we? Move I, th on? I, I think we should make sure we have consensus on this because you know we had a disagreement and I just want to see that everybody's at least you know comfortable standing aside if mm -hmm. um and and no strong opposition to the way it's okay. working. Is there a strong opposition to to leave it? Or oh, is there a strong opposition? Or oh, do I have? I don't know what the can. Is there a general agreement to leave it as it is now with five board members? Okay. Thank you. And remember, so I'm going to ask. Forgive me. Um, uh, forget <laughs> facilitator there. So. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, you didn't twinkle your fingers. Does that mean you're standing aside on this? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, then can we move on to the next one? And I know Coach Charlie has a question. So I uh, was reading in the uh, Q&A for C2A2, just like in C2A1, panel shall be no smaller than five board members. C2A2, in more serious cases, these panels shall have more than, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I can ask the question, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change for C2A2? Is there a general agreement to change him for what it was to the proposed changes? Thank you. Then can we move on to the next one? Yes, okay, go ahead. So the next one is also in this section and it's on a different question. And it was the uh, possibility of including um, a hearings officer type of role and then and this was also 
uh, something that the, the subcommittee went back and forth on uh, exceeding five minutes and therefore needs to circle back to, not necessarily to change or make a determination on. Um, and this was also something that was flagged as possibly something that would be resolved if that person were to be a staff person in the fourth phase where the commission will be talking about the staffing structure of the new oversight agency. And so it lives, it, it, there's no particular part of this document that, that says it right now, but there was a comment about it that, that refers to this. Thank you, staff. Is there a suggestion? Yes, Commissioner Catherine? Yeah, I, I think I raised that and I think I um, um, got comfortable with the C2A4 language about every panel having a, a presiding individual over each hearing um, and leaving that for a later determination about whether that would be, you know, a, um, a hearings officer or a member of the panel who is designated as the presiding member of the panel. So, um, so in my mind, the language we ended up with was C2A4 resolved that, at least for me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Catherine Kocher, Dan? Uh, yeah, I want to double back to C2A3 in a second, but I agree with you. And this uh, is one of those things I was going to refer to from our conversation with uh, Mr. Delegato about the police review board. So the police review board, this behind closed doors hearing that happened with this board that's made up of a majority of police officers, deadly force cases, there's four police officers and there's three, you know, uh, three people who are not police officers, uh, IPR staff person and two community members. Um, they are presided over by a facilitator that's hired from the outside. And uh, what Mr. Delegato uh, indicated is that those folks aren't necessarily, because they're professional facilitators, aren't necessarily 100% attuned to all the ins and outs of the police processes. So every once in a while, uh, the staff person for the police bureau has to chime in and say, oh, don't forget about this and or did you mean this and that, just to remind them what the protocols are. Uh, and so to me, it's kind of like, um, I asked the question, do you think that if with enough training that community members can run those meetings themselves, because the citizen review committee runs them themselves? And he said, yes. So I agree with you that um, they should be able to hire facilitators that they think they need them. Um, they should perhaps, like we do, rely on facilitators when um, we're trying to focus on the conversation. <laughs> we can't really focus on calling on people and following protocols. Um, so I think I agree with you. The language is good. Thank you. Commissioner Katherine, and thank you, Chris Sheridan. And I, we're going to review C2A3 and then go to C2A4, even if we are ready. Yeah. yeah so T C2A3, the question was whether we should say something, including if the members, and I, I shouldn't say appointed, because the, the charter says the members are going to be appointed by city council, so we can't change that. But including if the members are nominated by different people or entities. Um, but we haven't figured out that's going to be in the next phase where we decide who's going to nominate members to the board for the city council to confirm. Uh, but if, like, we're saying, you know, one is, um, you know, I don't know, some community group, and one is um, a business group, like we have, like on our on our commission, we have people from their business community, we have people from uh, community groups, uh, and you know, people from affected communities. So to, to make sure there's diversity, if you had all five members of the panel that were all nominated by the same entity, that would sort of undermine that idea of diversity. So, uh, so should we ask them, it says, including, I maybe mean, we could even say, including if appropriate, uh, if the members are nominated by different people or entities. Is that just your suggestion? Yeah, that is my suggestion, um, including, if appropriate, uh, whether the members are nominated by different people or entities, period. No, not mm -hmm. members of city council, by different people or entities. We don't know who's nominated them yet. That'll be decided in the next phase. Okay, thank you. Is there any discussion, question? Then I will ask the question. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? 
is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Thank you. We can move to the next one, the C2A4, and because there's not changes, Ooh. can we, oh, go ahead. Sorry, the next thing is C2B2. There oh. was already, yeah. Because we already discussed it to A4. Okay. Yeah, and there's no proposed change. Um, C2B2, and the question is not how, what the outcome should be. The question was whether or not this is something that's within the scope of the PAC to discuss, which is whether or not the board's recommendation of um, suspending an officer while administrative charges are pending could include that the suspension be paid or unpaid. So the, the, the item that was flagged for further discussion today is whether or not that's something that is within your scope at all to recommend. Are there any discussion or questions about C2, B2, or additional changes? Yes, Co-Chair Dan? I think Co-Chair Michelle Wesley raised this question. I guess I would just pose it to you, Co-Chair. Do you want to leave a sentence in there about that that recommendation will include whether or not it's paid or unpaid leave, or you want to just pull that out and let them figure that out later? Because it still says they can recommend suspending them, um, and then we can have them figure out whether they're allowed to ask for it to be paid or unpaid later. Thank you. Okay, is there any additional discussion? No, can we move on? Okay, let's move on. That is the last part of, um, of C2 and okay. maybe a, a good- um, Trying to take a point. Yes, it's 7.52, let's come back at 8 p.m. Let's take a seven and a half minutes break. Thank you. Apologies, just bear with me a moment on the screen share. Okay. Meantime, I'll say that we have a member of the Citizen Review Committee, a member of the Training Advisory Council, and a member of the PCCP here in the audience today. So that's very exciting. And, and that is are, pretty cool. Yes, and we're thankful that they're here. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to the next item of discussion. Apologies, this wasn't flagged as part of uh, C2 specifically because it's not um, it's not specific to C2, it's just this happens to be the first place it comes up. There was a flag uh, to circle back to all of the places where the, the methodology or thresholds of voting were clarified and simply uh, to remove, there's a proposal to remove uh, the, the phrases like by majority vote and leave those for the next phase. So in all cases, it would say something to the effect of the panel will decide whether to and then uh, allow the next phase <clears throat> to determine sort of what that methodology might be. Um, and that's in at least four different places, which um, this happens to be the first of those, but we'll flag the others as they come up and just note them so for transparency. Thank you, Steph. Okay, then uh, is there any suggestion, discussion, of adding or changing? The, there was already a proposal to remove, to remove it? all okay. the by majority vote type of phrases. So that, that's on the table already. Okay, are we discussing the agreeing to remove by majority vote? Is there any question about it or comments? No, then if 
So it, it is there is a, um, let me ask the two questions. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was and to the proposed change? Thank you. Can we move on? Okay, let's move on. So then there's uh, all of C3A, um, so, sorry, C3C4, C3C5, C3C6. And these have to do with the procedures for the hearings. And there's, as you can see, a million comments in here. So please bear with me as we try to split them off to make them readable. And Steph, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Co-Chair Charlie wants to say something. Co-Chair? Yeah, it was my understanding we're it's still going to say by a vote, just take out the majority. Okay, then can we go back to what the that, last one? That's not what was written, but it's you're, you're welcome to make that proposal. But even then, that would be, it says decision right now or decide. That, that's where it's at at the moment, just to clarify. And the methodology of deciding would be, as of right now, you, you're welcome to circle back to it and change it. Uh, just clarifying what, what the current text is. Okay, so Dan, I thought we were leaving. I think it's okay the way it is. Okay, all right. Wait. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, no, good, good, good check. Thank you, good chair. And, and staff, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm going to resize this to make it not collapse these comments. Um, but C3C is the procedure for the hearings. And then there were several different questions, but they're all kind of in the procedures. So it may be helpful to look at all three of these subsections together. Um, so under C3C4, board staff can ask questions at the invitation of the presiding individual. Um, and then whether or not uh, the officer complaining can request specific items about which the panel may ask more. And, and you can see all the comments in here that explain what the concerns were. Um, and then under C3, C6, it was through the panel was the, the key uh, com uh, topic of conversation of uh, calling witnesses, introducing exhibits, et cetera. Yes, uh, Coach Sheridan. Dan? Uh, Co-Chair Michelle Wesley and I were talking about how um, having the questions asked through the presiding officer or the you know the panel would cut down on the possibility of back and forths happening. Uh, can you talk say what it was that we were talking about when we had that conversation? Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly how that went. Um, what my concerns were. No, you you were you were saying that you agreed that it would be better to go through the panel instead of having them. Uh, kind of jump yeah. In well, true. Right. Um. I because I've seen that happen so many times. If there's not some form of kind of mediation, um, it could quickly get out of hand. Then do you have any suggestions or changes? Go share, Charlie. And um, let me just read it real quick. Where's so can ask questions at the invitation. I think that the, the language is written is the, is what was at, at issue, and I think it was perhaps Commissioner McDowell that was wondering why we're asking there to be a moderator. That I correct is my recollection correct, Commissioner McDowell? Yes, uh, Commissioner Cattery. Um, yeah, I mean, I I thought that it would be pretty awkward for 
um, the complainant or the officer not to be able to directly call witnesses, introduce exhibits, and cross-examine. And I don't know or impeach witnesses. I mean, frankly, it's not clear to me how um, an intermediary could cross-examine a witness for you. Um, but I, I guess, so I, I just thought this was an unusual um, procedural proposal. And to the extent that there was concern about the quorum or things getting out of hand, my sense is that the, the role of the presiding officer, the presiding member, whoever is running the hearing would be to maintain that decorum in the same way that a judge or hearings officer would maintain it. So, so I, I, I personally don't agree that this is an appropriate way to run a hearing. And um, the, you know, I wonder if a way around this is instead of us trying to dictate hearing procedures now, uh, instead we could propose something along the lines of that the board set, um, you know, set, create rules for governing their hearing procedures um, so that instead of us projecting what it is that um, is going to work in this context, we might just propose um, that the board uh, end up establishing their hearing rules. Um, it, that's pretty common, you know, the in most tribunals, you have um, a set of rules that is adopted by that particular tribunal about how you're going to conduct the hearing in, in front of them. And so people could look at that and then govern themselves accordingly. And that, that might be better than trying to dictate um, something like this now, especially something that is, in my opinion, pretty unusual. So, so that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Katherine. Commissioner Devi? So the CRC, you know, channels all of its things through the, you know, requests from everybody through the, the CRC. And I'm wondering if it would make sense to sort of compress all these things and just say that um, questions, requests for, um, to call witnesses, whatever shall be, um, funneled, that's not a good word, through the um, presiding individual or the or the panel. Something, you know, it, doing it sort of like that. So it's kind of generic, but that we're indicating that it makes sense to not have a lot of back and forth among all of the participants where you want to focus everything through your presiding individual and the panel and uh, for permission to do any of these things or to um, possibly post questions or ask for more information from the, for the other party, that kind of thing. Thank you, Commissioner Devi. Uh, and this was, this new sentence will substitute this last, yeah, these three. Okay, is there an additional discussion or comments or question? Uh, Commissioner Cattery? Well, I guess I would just say that that maybe rewards it, but it does not address the concern I had, which is um, having um, the, the um, you know, individual participants in the hearing not be able to um, directly um, you know, introduce exhibits or, um, you know, propose um, questions or call witnesses. It's, you know, all of this would be done, you know, you, you, the hearings officer would have to, you would propose the exhibit to the hearings officer who would agree to accept it or not. But the idea that you would ask the hearings officer to ask a question and then that hearings officer would ask the question, um, you know, results in a hearing being twice as long. Um, and I, I guess I just think it's a, um, a pretty awkward uh, procedure to dictate. Um, and I, you know, to me, the, you know, the way around us trying to decide something at this detail level would be to just defer it to the board. But, um, uh, 
to set its own hearing procedures. But I have to say, I, I, you know, I'm, um, I, I just can't agree to. I mean, I would not personally want to agree to a hearing procedure like this. And um, I would, if I came across a hearing procedure like this, I would, I would find it um, very inhibiting, either if I were the complainant or the officer. Thank you, Commissioner Catherine. Commissioner, uh, co-chair Charlie. Yeah, I, I agree. The more more you uh, talk about it, it does seem strange. But I I like what co chair my co chair Dan Handelman says channeled, not funneled, through the presiding individual who may also authorize direct questioning. What about that or something like that? Um, Commissioner Catherine, what do you think about that? Is that is the same? You are on mute. Yeah, I appreciate the efforts to compromise on this, and I. But again, I I think that we either, I I mean, should should sort of set it um, that something along the lines of that the complainant and the officer have the ability to call witnesses, introduce exhibits, cross examine, um, impeach witnesses, you know, et cetera, and that the board itself can decide later how what the procedures for doing that. Um, whether they want how, you know, how active the hearings officer is. It's, you know, my my thought is if somebody's looking at these hearing procedures and wants to know, are they fair? They're going to want to see that they can call witnesses, introduce exhibits, cross-examine witnesses. And, um, you know, it seems to me that the hearing procedure, exactly how that is done and the involvement of the hearings officer in it is something that the board ought to decide later. And that for us to say right now that we're going to put barriers on the complainant or the officer doing certain things at hearing just seems to me to be a, a bad idea. So. Thank you, Commissioner Catherine. Uh, co Chair Charlie? No, okay. Uh, Commissioner Devi? So what if you uh, started that sentence off that Samir just wrote and saying, once recognized by the presiding individual, the complainant officers have the ability to ask questions. To... No, okay, that's okay. I'm just trying. It's okay. Well, that's, I, that's totally I'm okay fine. if that's not good. But... No, that's totally fine because that's the whole way it would work. The hearings officer runs the hearing. So... I'm not saying that the complainant and the officer get to do whatever they want. They're, you know, they have to follow what the presiding individual tells them. But it's just that once they're not, once they're, you know, have the permission, once they're acknowledged, then they can do it directly. So to me, what you know, this this sentence that or sentences that was suggested is, um, you know is responsive to what my suggestion was. And I appreciate the, the effort to, um, you know, Samir's effort to try to capture my thoughts here. Thanks. And I, by putting that last sentence that the oversight board shall establish the guidelines and methods for these processes, it, it, you know, it does allow the board, if a majority of the board concludes this is the right way to do it, the way, you know, through doing it indirectly, then they can decide it just, um, but it would also allow uh, kind of a more typical hearing procedure too, if the board decided that was what was appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Catherine and everyone that put the last sentence. This last sentence, what I understand, will substitute any of the other ones uh, that we have been suggested. And I will ask the question, is there a strong opposition to changing from all what it was suggesting it was before to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to changing from what uh, Commissioner Co Co Dan? Well, if we're removing the thing about the investigators, then that they need to be included in the sentence, the rewritten sentence. Okay. That was highlighted by staff as one of the issues. That is a good question. If I can, inter sorry to interject. Um, <clears throat> was the intention behind this to replace C3, C5, and C3, C6 only? The original flag was there, or would it make sense to just say the complainant and officers, as well as board investigators, as per the or board staff 
as per the item above. Sure. Okay. Uh, Could you share Yeah, I'm uh, uh, curious. Is it is it all right to uh, look into the question and answer section about uh, uh, you made Delgado had had some input on this? Is that okay? I don't know. I don't know what the rules about that is. But that's my butchers, and I, I was going to read that in. So why don't you go ahead and read it? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it says, I assume that this language is crafted to avoid the, the fractious incidents that cause PPA to forbid participation uh, in CRC hearings. I also think that it's uh, unadvisable to allow untrained parties to cross-examine or be cross-examined directly um, and without counsel as the potential power imbalances could cause harm. Thank you, Coach Charlie. Mm -hmm. Is there, yeah, staff? This entire uh, section is under C3C, the header of which says throughout the subsection complaint, an officer may include their representatives and up at the top that that would include counsel. Um, so just maybe helpful to, to note that it, obviously you, uh, that would only be if, if the individual has counsel. Um, they have the right to have counsel under this draft, but not necessarily an obligation to do so currently. Thank you, Steph. Then can we go back to the to reviewing how the sentence the sentence with the proposed changes in adding was? Okay. Uh, the last sentence as it was is the highlighted. Co chair Dan. Right. So I, I didn't I, I don't think the board staff should be included in this kind of in the in the questioning and cross examining. I think this is just intent was to have them raise questions that didn't get raised by anybody else and that that would be in a separate item. So my suggestion is to leave that um, there where it is and as it is at the at the invitation of the presiding individual. Uh, and then I'm OK with the language that's being proposed here to place five and six. OK, um, with the understanding that so this is what we mean by it, that uh, if, if necessary, they're going to um, step in to prevent um, back and forth between the parties. So. OK. Then let's. Um, let's just ask for the last the last sentence, and I'm going to ask. Is there a strong opposition to changing from as it was to the proposed changes to substitute with the last sentence C3C5, C366, and the other uh, suggestion? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed changing or adding the new and the last sentence to substitute the numbers? That we refer. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, we passed that. Can we move on? <laughs> Thank you. Before, before we do, I just want to make it so does that mean every is okay with the language that was in C3, C4 that I said? I'd question to keep it because there are no questions that. we can just we can go and ask if we can move on for the c3 c4 okay can we move on uh with the three c3 c4 yeah thank you we can go to the next one okay so the next one is c3 f um and you can see another by majority vote that's been already addressed um, C3F1, and it has to do with the hearsay is admissible uh, phrase. This was flagged for further discussion, and you can see a couple comments here on the right. Uh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Um, that's the next one. Um, so this was flagged by Commissioner Simob to uh, hearsay, the, the hearsay is, is admissible text. 
and um, it ended up not getting circled back to in many ways. This one has not been discussed in, in detail. This is on a kind of preliminary pass through that it was flagged. Okay, then uh, we're gonna review C3 F1. Correct. Okay, is there a discussion, questions or comments a bit about C3 F1? Yes, uh, Commissioner Devi. So I don't really understand it. So could somebody explain what this, what the implications are of this? Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Devi. Commissioner Catherine. Yeah, I, I want to be um, deferential to Sima if, if he wants to um, talk first. I don't know. I, I can't see his um, his um, face, but I, I'm assuming he, he does not have his hand up. Is that right? He's here, but his camera is off, but he has been participating. Okay, uh, right. okay. go ahead, Commissioner. So, um, here's, you know, hearsay is when it's, um, you are saying, well, I, you're testifying, well, I heard from my friend that, um, such and such happened instead of you're saying directly, I saw this happen. So hearsay is basically one step removed. You're reporting what another person has said. And you're reporting that for the truth of what they said. You're trying to prove a fact, but you're doing it through what you heard from another person. So it's basically kind of secondhand information. And um, typically um, hearsay in a court is not admissible, although there's exceptions to that. But typically it's not admissible because it's viewed as um, unreliable evidence because you, the person who um, that evidence is coming in against is not able to cross-examine or confront the, the person who did the talking. You know, you're, it's because it's secondhand and that person is not there. You don't have the ability to confront or cross-examine the person who's being reported as saying, you know, X or Y. I hope that's making sense to people. So, you know, normally the way our system works is you have the right to cr confront or cross-examine anybody who's saying something negative to you. But if the person who is saying something negative to you is not there, there it's only that their words are being reported in the court, you know, you don't have the ability to directly confront the person who's saying this. So that's why hearsay is typically inadmissible. Now, in an administrative process, hearsay is admissible. And that's just um, because administrative processes are less formal. They have evidentiary rules that are more inclusive. And the idea is in an administrative process, more information comes in, it's more informal. Um, potentially because the, you know, the stakes are considered maybe lower than you would have in a, you know, a typical criminal justice system or even in um, a civil court, um, hearsay typically comes in. So I think in this context, because this is an administrative process, that's why, you know, I think it would be expected that hearsay would come in. Then the other, but the point then is that whoever's hearing that evidence understands that hearsay is less persuasive evidence than a direct a direct statement from somebody because hearsay is hearsay it's secondhand you don't have the ability to confront the person who's being quoted and so but a, an administrative tribunal is basically sort of charged with um the responsibility of hearing that evidence but giving it sort of the value it's worth um and, and perhaps the difference is because you don't have juries in an administrative process. And so there's a view that perhaps the people on who are hearing these administrative cases can do a better job of discounting the value of the evidence than perhaps a jury who would be inflamed by hearsay and wouldn't understand that it's ultimately less reliable than direct evidence. So hopefully that was clear. Um, I will just say that I, I'm fine with this because this is an administrative tribunal. Um, and I think it would be unusual if hearsay were not admissible in this context, but it is, I understand why questions came up too, because it's not typically admissible in a, in a criminal court, for example. 
Thank you, Commissioner Catherine. Would you leave it like that or would you add something to the text? No, I, I think this is what is stated here would be the typical standard you would find in an administrative proceeding. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, let me, because this one not changed, can we move on to next? Okay, thank you for the explanation. Let's move on. The next item is C3F2, which is immediately below the one that was just being discussed. Um, this had a long comment, so I'll try to make it fit at the same part of the page. And this relates uh, to a previous question um, about uh, new information being added into um, subsequent discussions or hearings or review. So um, and it had to do specifically with um, verification of new information that was brought up. I think co-chairs may know more about the details of this one. Thank you, staff. Uh, Co-chair Charlie or Co-chair Dan, do you want to explain or talk about this? Uh, yeah, well, there's a footnote that's um, off the edge of the screen, which uh, I, I'd like you to scroll down to. It's uh, that this is from Portland City Code 3.21.160B. Um, and this actually ties into the question we might come back to a little later on about the appeals, where th this is the, the part that's describing uh, um, the appeals process um, and, and uh, the current appeals process under, under the Citizen Review Committee. And th this language is almost directly lifted from there. So the point is, oh, I don't know what my point, my, my, I guess my point is that they, um, they can consider the new information that they got at the hearing uh, to make a decision whether to send it back for more investigation, but they can't consider it to make a finding because it hasn't been verified. So even though Commissioner McDowell is quite right about saying that hearsay is allowed, you don't want to have like a, a, you know, a photograph introduced in the middle of a hearing that could have been um, you know, uh, photoshopped uh, and then sit in the base your decision on that because it looks like a real solid thing and not hearsay uh, without somebody checking to make sure that the photograph is, is real. So that that's the point behind it. And again, I, we, I argued against this um, when when it was put in the city code, but I understand it now better, and I think it makes more sense, especially when with a board that's making the final decision about um, uh, whether the officer should be disciplined. Thank you. There's uh, no suggestion for changing or adding anything, Coach Dan. Just leave it like it is. I don't know. I, I can't remember who it was that brought up the con conversation on this one. Okay, if there's not uh, adding or changing or any more discussion, uh, my question is, can we move on? Oh, I see what the problem was. Oh, sorry, uh, facilitator Lara. The problem was that the, uh, inform the evidentiary record includes whatever came up at the hearing. So I think um, they, they may not incorporate the new information uh, to uh, make a, uh, to uh, determine a finding is what we meant by that. But okay. We should change that language in the evidentiary record. Uh, mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I saw her comment in the in the uh, comments over there. I hope that helps. Is that any additional suggestion or changes? Okay. I'm going to ask the question, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed changes? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Okay, thank you. Can we move on to the next one? Okay. The next one is C4 which has to do with providing information to complainants and officers. And under C4C, there was a uh, proposed addition to add and officers um, to this. And it just, I don't think it ever was discussed if co-chairs may be able to remind me, but I don't think there was a discussion that ran over time or anything yet. Uh, 
I think it was just a proposal that happened outside of the order and never got resolved. Thank you, staff. Okay, there is a proposed change to add officers to the sentence. Is there a comment, questions? No? Okay, then I'm gonna ask the question. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Thank you. Can we move on to the next one? Okay. That concludes section C. Um, we'll go into section D, which is discipline. Uh, there was a flagged item here on D1. And uh, co-chair Dan may be able to explain this better, but it, it just asked, is it DPSST is the only information that, that I know on this one. Thank you, staff. Uh, co-chair Dan? Right, so I think the issue is we had this long list of what discipline may include or not. And some of it came from um, state law, and some of it came from uh, existing collective bargaining contracts and the uh, attendant um, correctional, correctional action guide. I can't remember what exactly, the, the new name for the discipline guide. Um, and uh, I think the concern is that if we write too much specific stuff in here, that if the um, correction guide gets changed in the future, that we're going to have it locked into city code. Um, I agree generally with that concern, but I want to make clear that uh, there should be uh, additional uh, options other than just imposing discipline. We've been talking from the beginning about having um, you know, procedural justice for the officers. Um, I know Commissioner Michelle Wesley would give me a better term than that procedural justice, but that we just want to make sure that um, uh, that in addition to um, people a day off, that they can have some kind of educational aspect that will help them do a better job in the future uh, if they're going to remain on the on the police force. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Dan. Is there a suggestion? So, Coach Charlie, would you like to add something? No, no I, I just, it's correct, corrective action guide, I believe. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there questions or suggestions about this? Well, I, I'm just going to propose that say just make D1A2 say uh, discipline may include uh, various um, uh, I don't know uh, abrogations or that's not the right that's a too fancy of a word but you know various um, I don't know. Um, starting to get late, folks. Uh, <laughs> various punishment. I don't want to use the word punishment either, but how about I'll remedies? Word in a minute. A very, what's that? Remedies. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I don't know. Various. Uh. various <laughs> I'm going to say punishment, so I'll look up a, a, a um, another word later. They include various punishments uh, for the officer, as well as education-based alternatives um, to ensure uh, 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 better behavior in the future, you know, not to ensure, but to, to encourage uh, uh, better performance by the officer in the future. Um, so, you know, something along those lines, and I, I'll see what I can find, as, unless somebody else has already done it for as a synonym for uh, punishment, because that's not really what we mean. Consequences? Uh, yes, yes, Con consequences. Perfect. Thank you, perfect, yes. Okay, is there additional comments, questions? Let me thank you, Co-Chair Charlie and Co-Chair Dan. What about the... Once that's highlighted, oh, they're taking it out. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask then the questions. Is there a strong opposition to changing from as it is to the proposed change? Uh, 
Coacher Charlie, do you have a question or comment? No, okay. Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Thank you. And just for clarity, I'm, I'm suggesting going out the next subsection as well that uh, explains what education-based alternatives are. You've that what we just put in there and that gets cut too. Okay. Thank you. Should so I including the sub subsections? Right. Yeah, that, that whole next subsection, yes. That's what well, that's what I proposed before we twinkled our fingers and okay. I can that. ask again. Okay. Yeah, and, and and Commissioner Christian uh wants to say something, and then I can ask again. Okay. Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, if we're taking out the the uh, subsection under that as well, I'd, I'd uh, propose that we take the language out of D1A4I or Norman numeral one or whatever um, to replace uh, encourage better performance by the officer in the future with uh, promote a positive outcome and, and avoid employee embitterment. If no one else has an objection to that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I will ask the question again. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? And we need to uh, thank you. Okay. Can we move on? Okay. There's a question that was asked at the end of, of D. Sorry, before we get to that one, there's one before that. So D2, B1. Um, D2 is due process and just cause rules. B1 had a flag for further discussion. When discipline is imposed by the board, the panel which decided on the findings shall hold the due process hearing. And the question that was flagged was, is it appropriate for this to be the same panel? And can maybe uh, kick this back to co-chairs if they've got more details on this. Co-chair Charlie or co-chair Dan, do you have details on this? Um, can you point me again to where that question is? Is it appropriate? Oh, I see. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's that. That's just the question. But so, um, uh, reviewing how we set up the appeal system right now, that if um, the person appealing whether it be the officer or the complainant, the community member, um, or the officer if they're the complainant. If they're, so if they're filing an appeal uh, because they disagree with the findings, we agree the same uh, panel should not hear it unless there's new information. And if there's new information, they should hear it again. So then if the officer is saying, um, uh, I had a hard day and my, uh, you know, my health isn't good and I, I just needed to, to do something and you know, I really wish you wouldn't set this punishment on me because I, you know, it's something that, should, you should mitigate my my uh, discipline because of it. Should that go back to the same panel that already made the decision in the first place? Because that's not. I mean, I guess it is new information in the sense that the officer is trying to offer why they feel like they shouldn't get this discipline. So, um, should we write it in that it should be the same panel, or should we just let them hide that later? Because it says the panel which decided on the finding shall hold a due process hearing. So right now we're envisioning it as being same panel. We'd have to change that if we want it, if, it, if we don't think it's appropriate. Thank you. And, you know, I don't see Commissioner Sim up here. Maybe he is there in the, because he has raised his hand. 
to Yeah, Commissioner Sima, I think, okay, I don't know. Maybe I'm confused. Co-chair Charlie? Um, could you go back to that so I could read it again? I'm wondering if we could just, instead of use the word shall, maybe like can't. Um, something that leaves it open to allowing them to make that decision it is imposed by the board the panel could decide on i don't know i'm how getting about, tired <laughs> yeah i have an idea how about i just say you know a a panel of the um a, a panel made of up of board members shall um hold a due process hearing and then they could decide um, whether it's the same panel or not. Thank you. Is there an additional suggestions or questions about this? Okay, I'm gonna ask the question. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was as, as to the proposed change? Uh, I think I think uh, I think Co-Chair Michelle uh, Wesley has Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, Simov is asking to get back in. Oh yes, thank you. I saw your hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to change him from what it was to the proposed change? Okay. Thank you. Can we move on to the next? Okay. Okay, so the next item is just below it um, on the screen. It's a question that was flagged that um, may just be a question. There's no current proposed change. Um, if an officer refuses to comply with compelled testimony since the board will already have the facts of the misconduct, does an investigation have to happen or does the case just go to a panel to decide the level of discipline up to and including termination? Is there any, uh, yeah, go chair Dan? Yeah, I, I think we should move this to the, um, well, I, I suppose the future phases document but just, you know, just put it, flag it for future discussion. I don't think we need to put it in the code here, um, but it's just, I think it's something we should talk about if we have time as a commission. Okay, then we can put it at the end. Okay, can we move on to the next? Okay. By the way, I apologize for the crackly sound of my voice before. I had a problem with my phone here. I fixed it. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next one after this is E3. So this concludes uh, D, which is discipline. Now we're into appeals. And this particular question may be familiar because it is uh, something that we discussed today under B2 um, as well as C3F2. And it has to do with uh, the, the closed record of new evidence um, going into the evidentiary record. That's the same sort of question here. So this was flagged for further discussion. Um, regarding this and this may have been resolved to some degree but the flag wasn't removed so if if the people person or people who had um concerns about it could establish if they still do that might be helpful and i'll pass it back to co-chairs thank you Steph. 
And the person who has concerns, so the co-chairs can talk about this. E3. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to find the city code. So I, this earlier today, we were having the pre-meeting uh, with the staff. I flagged uh, city code 3.21.160, which is titled hearing appeals, right? This is in the current city code. And it describes uh, an appeal hearing shall be conducted uh, after a vote of the committee to hold such a hearing um, and describes what happens at it. That's section A. And then section B says, um, uh, when the committee's review process develops new information, the committee may consider the new information when determining, sorry, closed captioners and um, signing people, <laughs> uh, new information uh, when determining if additional investigation is warranted, but the committee may not incorporate the new information into the evidentiary record, the committee considers when determining if a, if a finding is supported by the evidence, which is essentially, as the staff just said, what we just talked about. But my, but my point in reading this to you is that this is described as part of an appeal hearing in the city code as it is. So uh, either way, whether it's an appeal um, based on the existing evidence or an appeal based on new evidence, current city code describes them both as appeals. And that they, I think that's what we're, where we got bogged down on this before. So we're not changing anything by referring to something as an appeal where um, it's, it might have new information introduced into it. And I know I, I can see Commissioner McDowell being concerned about this because it's confusing, but that that I'm just you know we're just carrying forward nomenclature that's already being used here in Portland. Thank you, Commissioner. No, go ahead. And Commissioner Catherine, do you have questions or comments? Um, I guess I'm I'm wondering what are we talking now about E three A four. It's both E3A4 and the highlighted part of E3A that says the presence of new information. And there were comments on both parts. So is the idea that people are pointing to new information and saying they want an appeal because they have that information has not been considered previously? Is that the idea? Yes. Okay. Is there a way, is there a way to make that clear? Um, uh, I think people would typically say is the discovery of new information instead of the presence of new information that that would I mean that that would make it clearer to me at least. And then it change introduction to discovery as well. Yes, I think so. All right, I'm down with that. What about everybody else? <laughs> okay. I can ask the questions, thank you. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Okay, thank you. Can we move on to the next one? Okay. So the next one is in between these two ones. Uh, and the question had, uh, this was a question that came up um, about uh, E3A1, 2, and 3. Um, in E3, and this is maybe just a question that, that may be very easy to resolve. Um, is there a distinction between what is called a board appeals committee in A3, A1, E3, A2, E3, A3, and what's referred to as an appeals panel in the rest of the uh, section. Why, why, yes, there is. Like the, the idea is that there'd be, okay, so let's pretend, I'm just throwing a number out there. So let's pretend there's 20 members on the new board. Like there's 20 members of this commission. Um, 
and 15 of them are, are rotating through the, being the hearings panel. And then five of them are the assigned to be the appeals committee and they're specialists in appeals. So they're the board appeals committee. Um, but then whatever panel, here's the appeal, because it could be the original hearings panel just hearing new evidence so that they don't have to start the case again from scratch. Or it could be the specialist specialty uh, appeals committee that's sitting as the appeals panel. So that's what the difference is. And that, if there's a way to make that more clear, then great. Uh, yeah, I think that the question that came up um, was whether or not this should be in this phase or not, as opposed to the content issue, um, just to clarify what the flag ended up being. Whether this was sort of a structure of the membership as opposed to a in service of the power and duty of holding appeals um, was the question. So I'll kick it back to the members and facilitator, Victoria. Thank you. Is there any question or suggestions about leaving this or changing it or sending or just put in for the next phase? Come on, Christian, tell us what's on your mind. Yes, Christian. I, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what, um, I guess I'll ask, does it, does anyone, would anyone feel strongly about keeping it? Like, because I, I, I understand the concern and I could see this being just figured out in a future fav, phase, because it does feel a little bit like a structural thing. So I'm not personally opposed to taking out this, but it's kind of a large chunk so I'm um, I'm also not like let's get it out of here right now. I just want to check in with everyone and see how would people feel temperature check if if we did take it out. Yes, Commissioner Debbie. I feel like we've got it figured out, and we and people are happy with this conclusion. We should just leave it in, save uh, some work for the next round. I have a proposal. Yes. For a compromise language, my proposal is to say. A certain number of board members may be assigned to a board of appeals committee. And in that way, we can um, discuss it further later if people want. Okay. I'm going to ask the question if there's no more comments. Is there a strong opposition to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Is there a general agreement? to change in from what it was to the proposed change. Okay. Thank you. I, I just, can I ask staff, so I see in the chat, you've pasted how many sections there are. How many are left now? One we're more. We're running up against block time. I believe it's one more. There's one more flag, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank so, you. Can we move on? Let me ask this to the next one. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Steph. Sorry. So this concludes um, section E on appeals. Um, it should be noted that there are a couple of items that you'll see in the comments of that are flagged for garden plot or asking questions. They're not flags for other discussion, and many of them are also just what will go in the footnoting when it gets reformatted. But there's nothing else. Um, in section E. Um, and then under F, lost track of this one, apologies. I think the last thing oh, yes. was so, to so. change officers to office, officers instead of officers. There, there was a, yeah, just as a, a sort of um, question for the members when it refers to officer singular that is the subject of a complaint um, to ask for uh, sort of kind of like this is the, the majority vote question of just a blanket across the board request if it's uh, accurate to say officer and then a parentheses S to open the door to singular or plural if there is a complaint that is directed at multiple 
or that is that multiple officers are subject to, or if there's an issue with that. Cause I, I can't remember when that came up, but I noted it down to bring up today. Thank you, staff. Uh, Co-chair Dan? Well, I think since we're trying to make this an even playing field, then you should look and see whether there's any place where a complainant should be complainants if there's multiple people complaining about the same incident. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, just, I, I, I'm okay with that. Um, I also have one other language thing that came in from Commissioner Ariana Bauer uh, in between. So let's finish this one up and I want to double back to that. Okay. Let me then ask the questions. Is there a strong opposition to changing from officer, parenthesis, S officers, and also complaint? Oh, I'll have to ask the question. We can do those together. Okay. And complaint uh, S to the proposed change. Is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Okay, thank you. All right, well, so we're so close to done. So the last thing is that we skipped over A7 and probably somewhere else in this document or these two documents, which would be one document soon. Um, it says internal affairs, yes, there you go. Um, and uh, staff has found this. So in the flow chart I showed you this evening, I changed internal affairs to uh, internal affairs, the appropriate city's body. Um, uh, and so I think that I, I'd like to leave internal affairs there, um, assuming that it's going to possibly still exist, but say, you know, internal affairs or appropriate city body, uh, investigative body, uh, anywhere where internal affairs shows up. Sure, Oriana Bowers nodding their head, I think means that's a good idea. Okay, then uh, your suggested changes is, and every time we say internal affairs or appropriate cities body? Yeah, appropriate city investigatory body, yeah. Investigative body, okay. Can we try to, um, yeah. Thank you. And I can ask the question. So which, which words would be removed? I know what would be added. I'm just trying to clarify. Uh, I was thinking that we add those words after the words internal affairs, anywhere the, where the word internal affairs is. So uh, members of the police bureau, including, yeah. Commissioner Christian. I think so. I, I, I know this was already stated, but I just want to clear, uh, make sure that I understood that this is, this would replace, um, this would go everywhere in the document. This is similar to the, to the officers complainants and um, majority vote. Uh, Suggestions, correct? All right. Cool. Thank you. Every time and every time it says that in the document, and I'm gonna ask the question: Is there a strong opposition to changing from as it was to the proposed changes? Every time we say internal affairs, is there a general agreement to changing from what it was to the proposed change? Okay, the subcommittee has completed discussion of this document. Congratulations. And next on the agenda is discussing whatever the subcommittee should refer to the document to the full commission. With all the changes we have made today incorporated into the text. There is a potential agreements document that was circulated that gives some context as this as to this, this decision. It also says that co-chairs and the staff will be authorized to fix some of the formatting and typos prior to the full commission's consideration. Before seeing if there is a consensus around referring this document, we're going to hear from the public. After that, we'll ask if members want to make any final tweaks and then ask if they are ready to make a decision. Now we ask members of the public to keep their comments to two minutes in length and keep their comments focused on the draft document. You can raise your hand in Zoom when you like to be called on. Will any of the members, um, no, 
Any of the members of the public would like to make a comment? And I see uh, Mr. Delgado raise his hand. Welcome, Mr. Delgado. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you may Delgado, uh, vice chair of the CRC. I just wanted to um, answer one question that I, I think was kind of posed in the chat here. So the CRC currently has, with regards to um, gender equity and uh, diversity on the CRC, we currently have 11 members. Uh, one just resigned yesterday, unfortunately, but uh, we have, we up until now had 11 members, five of which identify, use he, him pronouns, five of which use uh, she, her pronouns, and one person who uses they, them pronouns. So there is, I think, currently uh, a pretty good emphasis on picking, um, maintaining a good gender balance, um, picking people from different ethnic backgrounds and walks of life. I do think that a thing that uh, the commission should consider is that that does not necessarily translate to who serves on these um, police review boards, right? Because that is very much influenced by um, who is available during the day. And so that does not always um, necessarily favor, you know, people from different different economic backgrounds. I also would say, to the best of my knowledge, the um, IPR's PRB uh, list is made up of a, a similarly diverse number of people. I have done, I believe, seven PRBs, and only one of them has been staffed from that IPR pool by um, a uh, femme-presenting person. So I'm not sure... Again, I, I suspect that that goes to access. Um, as far as the document goes, I, I think you all have done a really wonderful job and I commend you for that. Uh, building on the comment I left, I think the only thing I was gonna note is that some of the procedures that the CRC currently has in place for hearing appeals are based on a desire to make sure that these uh, meetings do not become uh, confrontational. And while I understand that people need to have equal hearing, I do think it's a little dangerous in a situation where people may not be coming with advocates um, or with counsel to give them too free a hand in cross-examining each other or creating circumstances where you can have an officer uh, coming into direct confrontation with a member of the public. So um, I think the compromise language that you all adopted tonight is, uh, is good, uh, but I would definitely encourage you to keep that in mind if you decide to revise that or um, make any other changes down the road. So that's, I think those are my only two things. One thing I would encourage you all to consider is um, the new discipline guide that took effect, I think last year. We're just starting to see that now on police review boards and it's definitely a lot more complicated. Um, and in many ways, although I think it's meant as a stab at equity, um, I think it actually makes it a little bit more difficult to exercise any sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, discretion in how we recommend discipline for officers. It's a very, um, it's a very prescribed system now. So I'd be curious to see how the deliberations of this body uh, end up working with that as we move forward or or what the the end result will be after talking with or after negotiating with PPA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delegado. We really appreciate your comment and value your participation. Thank you for being here with us. Are there any other comments for public? No? Okay. Then we will move to the next item on the agenda. And my oh. next item is to ask- oh, sorry, Victoria. Yes. Um, could I? I was uh, wondering if I could read a comment from an advanced public comment document into the, I don't know if it's just coaches that can do that or not. Um, there was an advanced public comment that came in that I was hoping to read into the record if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, this came from Philip uh, Chachka um, and I wanted to read it in because it's um, somewhat relevant to the, the language suggestion that we did at the end there on internal affairs. Um, just wanted to read that in. Um, Catherine McDowell on 1215, December 15th, 2022, asked about the role of the new board and possible overlap with internal affairs. 
I think it's important that the new board has the power and ability to investigate and discipline for all misconduct. Internal misconduct should face external oversight, especially egregious misconduct or misconduct that affects the community. I believe currently the police will sometimes classify misconduct as accusations as internal, even when the misconduct was against a community member because another officer made the complaint. These types of complaints should be addressed by the new board. For instance, if one officer reports sex abuse or theft or other misconduct of another officer, the community should be allowed to hold them accountable. Another related issue, if I file a complaint, I wouldn't want IA and the board to investigate. I want one investigation team uh, and it would create a barrier to making two claims if two investigations are happening at the same time. I believe the police would also not appreciate being investigated twice and having two face to having face to face two findings, apologies, from two different boards with possibly conflicting findings and or other conflicting discipline. Um, would the community board decision supersede the IA and police admin decision? Question mark. So the new the new language just gives us a little more flexibility in the future to continue continue considering that. That was the only reason. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Christian. Okay, then we can go to the next. And my question is, will any of the members of the subcommittee like to revisit any portion of the draft areas of agreement? I don't see nothing. Then I will ask the question, is there any strong opposition to referring the draft areas of agreement to the full PAC commission for their consideration? Is there general agreement around referring the draft areas of agreement to the full PAC for their consideration? Yay, congratulations. Woohoo! That's, um, that's a lot of work and you should be very proud. We yeah, are not I'd like I'd like to thank my co chair and all the members of the subcommittee and all the time <laughs> that we put in. It's yes. a big big heavy lift and we got through it. Thank you. Couldn't have done it without you, Dan. <laughs> Congratulations. Now I will pass it to the staff. Oh. For the garden plot. No, we're not doing the next steps. Oh, for next steps. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah um, so next steps for this document and actually for the phase of work in general um, is that this will go to the agenda for the Monday, February 6th meeting of the full commission. The full commission has already started work on, uh, but not yet concluded it on the subcommittee on structural oversights referred document. So that'll be first on the agenda. And um, after it is concluded, next on the agenda is this document. So it's not necessarily anticipated that there'll be a, a lot of the Monday meeting time going to this document. Nonetheless, some time will hopefully go to that. And then whatever, um, however much time goes on Monday to it is likely that all of the Thursday um, the middle of the Thursday meeting of the full commission, that's Thursday, February 9th, will be focused on this document. And so ideally within one and one and a half at most, maybe a little less than that, uh, full commission meetings, um, this document, uh, the draft areas of agreement on officer accountability would be um, discussed, adapted, and approved by the full commission as the areas of agreement on officer accountability at that point. And uh, that will be one of the three uh, final outcome documents that would conclude the phase of work. The second one is the structural oversight document that just mentioned, which will probably get done on Monday. And the third one is already done, which is the subcommittees uh, or the areas of agreement on um, access to information. So essentially at the full commission level, once this document is approved, uh, likely next Thursday at earliest, then um, that'll conclude the phase of work altogether, uh, which is why um, you'll see starting to hear more about structure and details work coming up later in the month of um, February. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Now, and thank you, Commissioner Catherine, for your message. Now we will take open public comment on the issues the subcommittee is discussing, or community members can also tell their story about policing and police accountability. We ask members of the public to keep their comments or questions 
to two minutes in length and raise their hand in Zoom if you like to speak. Okay, let's move on. Now we go to the garden plot. Is this is the time for facilitators, co-chairs, oh, com, uh, Commissioner Sima, go ahead. Apologies, I just wanted to wait and make sure that um, our attendees had uh, an opportunity. Um, I do wanna bring up, um, and it's very, very relevant to our work, uh, that you know um, we're trying to create a system that would hold police accountable um, from, from a myriad of things, including uh, you know, uh, what happened to then uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, and it's, it's a good time to remind everybody and let everybody know that today's news was that Officer Brian Hunsicker, uh, who was uh, formerly the PPA president, was uh, fired by uh, Mayor Wheeler last year in February. But um, arbitration is bit, uh, is batting um, 100 at this point where um, uh, fired officers uh, firings are overturned and he will be returning uh, back. He'll be reinstated um, uh, with back pay minus one week. Um, and the, these aren't these aren't this is not accountability, particularly the statements that comes from um, the, the PPA and the arbitration, which I think we're still waiting on the full statement from arbitration, but arbitration basically had come back and said in a small clip, and I want to keep it very short, but um, an injustice can be done when a good police officer is terminated for a for political or other reasons, not justified by the facts. It is this arbitrator's conclusion that the discharge of uh, Brian Hunsaker falls into that category. So, you know, I, I appreciate everybody, and I appreciate uh, what we're uh, what we're doing here, um, and a lot of what I'm also learning along the way, um, uh, being around uh, just the progress that we're able to celebrate going through today, but also be reminded that these are the things that we're trying to create accountabilities around. Thank you, Commissioner Sima. Now I will pass uh, to co-chairs if they have something on the garden plot. Um, so yeah, well, co-chair Michelle Wesley's had some, let's just say, uh, email problems. And so we're going to try to get you the, um, the uh, summary of the discussions that we had um, with uh, Mr. Hager and Mr. Delegato. Um, you know, hopefully before Monday's meeting, I, I think we get got you the gist of it, what you needed for today. So we want to do that. And then we're like, um, as the staff said, that we're going to be able to help tweak the uh, revised version. So we're going to kind of look at that and make sure all the all the footnotes and everything are carried over properly and that we that we did the right, you know, we've cited the right thing. In there. Um, and you know, that includes for instance, I you know I realize there's a definition in somewhere in there of what uh, preponderance of the evidence means, and that's just got to be pulled up to the definition section. So we'll go through it um, uh, ourselves and along with staff to make sure that it's uh, as good as possible when it goes to the rest of the commission. So thank you everybody again for helping us get this far. Thank you, Coach Dan. Um, staff. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> there is an entire section um, at the bottom of the. Um, I guess the part two of the outline, which is a garden plot for future sections, we moved that question about um, what happens if an officer refuses to comply with compelled testimony into that. That's not part of the document as it will be referred. It is garden plot text, but you know it's a reference point. So nothing new to add beyond what was already there and what got moved to it um, already. So um, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, you can now submit advanced public comment to the Police Accountability Commission via web form, voicemail, or postal mail. Thank you to all of the members who attended today's meeting and for your contributions today. Thank you also to the interpreters. 
And finally, thank you to all the members of the community for attending and contributing with your questions and thoughts. If you're not ready, sign up for email updates. Please also sign up to receive updates from the PAC. It is 9.18 p.m. and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.